I've always loved hearing stories about mermaids and myth and legends and the possibility of if something like that could actually be real. However, several instances in the past two decades back up the possibility of a flesh and blood creature being among us. A real life mermaid and mermen in the here and now. From surface dwelling sunbathers to deep sea harpooners, we really do not know what dwells. Do you know what the real secret of the deep blue ocean really is? Why over 95% of people that watch my videos are not subscribed? Click the subscribe button guys, help me get to a thousand subscribers. The Little Mermaid, 1989, Breakdown and Analysis. The scene opens up with three seagulls, and then turns to the ocean, and we see four dolphins. Three plus four equals seven, and G is the seventh letter of the alphabet. This scene gives acknowledgement to the creator. Symbology, as above the seagulls, so below the dolphins. The bow of the boat pays homage to the mermaid. The rear of the boat has the face of an owl at the bottom, and a crown at the top. On the top of that crown, kind of looks like a UFO. The prince and his dog are the depiction of the fool tarot card. The creators are insulting the viewers. Dialogue between characters disclose facts disguise the stories. Gives us an insight to who is in charge of the species of aquatic humanoids. The captain, Sir Grimsby, is likened to that of a skeptic that quickly dismisses talk of folklore. One of the sailors exclaims his statements are true while holding a red herring. This brief scene foreshadows the entire movie being the opposite of a happy fairy tale ending. At face value, it's just a normal fish. But those that have eyes to see and ears to hear understand what I'm explaining. A red herring is a metaphor for intentionally misleading or distracting from the actual facts. After the red herring escapes to the ocean, we can see a few other examples of symbolism. The ocean flowers, Fibonacci sequence, orange fish, orange is the color of control of the elite, which is why prison uniforms are orange. The jellyfish, representing being in flow, re regeneration, intuition, and most importantly, immortality. The eye of the whale, or the all-seeing eye, those with the knowledge and control. Then, finally, we see mermen, mermaids, and merchildren swimming in groups, pods, or tribes. Very far beneath the ocean, they reside in subterranean cities made of gold, showing us that this is a people with a permanent residence on the earth. According to folklore, mermaids are attracted to shiny things. Gold and silver, being lost on voyages, would be the easiest items for them to acquire. Gold is a great conductor of electricity, it never rusts, and it is one of the softer, more malleable metals. Note, a common theme in the architecture are pillars, spirals, and balls of light or orbs at the top. On both sides of the entrance we see seven orbs to the main entrance on smaller pillars and bigger orbs on the outer columns leading to the trident at the top or the apex of the entrance. Trident is the symbol of power. The mer people gather in an amphitheater to hear, the, to hear a symphony performed. Some minor details, the top left is either an incomplete circle or the Ouroboros. The stage is in the shape of an eye, but a more, it looks more like an oyster with the conductor's podium where the pearl should be. Observe the color purple as royalty, or the highest level of enlightenment. The orange fish briefly enters the frame. Then, King Trident enters the theater. He's portrayed how we would portray God or Zeus. As he activates his trident, it makes a whirring sound like electricity. Then, he uses it to create a chandelier of pearls. Even the people themselves wear the pearls. Sebastian is the embodiment of the masculine and feminine in the scene. As above, red, so below, blue. And we see it flip in real time. Once the orchestra begins the symphony, the mermaids come out of a scallop shell. This scene reminds me of the painting Birth of Venus, which embodies the birth of civilization, a new hope, and most importantly, a social and cultural shift, possibly referring to an age shift from Pisces to Aquarius. The six sisters introduced all focused in on their seventh sister, Ariel, who is absent, which means we will not have this cultural shift or social change to be open to new race, races or species and their interaction with the human population. She's simply absent. They intentionally do not say Ariel's name. They say Ari, which means eagle, lion, or sun-like, while El means deity, god, or sun, sunray. My interpretation is that leaving out the L means that 
while these beings are an advanced culture with advanced technology, they should not be elevated to God status. They are still mortal beings, and having advanced technology does not make them gods. The scene concludes with King Triton being upset that this cultural shift will not happen. Even he believes that it's about time that this interaction takes place. Then we get a scene change. Ariel embodies the sacred feminine and masculine colors, her hair being red, her fin being blue. They join on the middle of her body where the bikini top is. Purple is royalty and enlightenment color. The rear of the boat has a menacing face. The rudder is in the shape of a blade, or the alpha symbol. We see a shark, or danger is always lurking around the corner. No environment is completely safe. Living anywhere has its drawbacks. Even in North America and Canada, we're not safe from the grizzly bear, and we still have to be careful. Mermaids are said to like shiny things. This seems to be a sterling silver fork that Ariel finds. It's also in the shape of a trident, a symbol of power. Note that the pipe is held like a horn, so possible reference to sound, like a sonar or underwater calls that they could make between each other. So I think it's possible that because sharks look for seals as their main source of food, and the mermaids swim like a seal, that there's a real consistent threat of sharks attacking mermaids. So I think that this representation is very accurate. Humans deal with sharks all the time, so I highly doubt that they'll discriminate, whether you're an aquatic humanoid or a land-based humanoid. Finally, ultimately, there are still animals with the consistent behavior patterns that can be outsmarted. And then this scene finally concludes with Ariel going to the surface or entering a whole new world. The way that the sun reflects on the water looks like a portal, so she's literally going into a whole new world. The scene has Scuttle mumbling 1492, the year Columbus sailed across the ocean in order to quote-unquote find America. So maybe this is when mermaids were also first discovered, as in maybe there's a journal entry somewhere that's not available to the public. Whoa, what a swim! He makes a statement, oh, what a swim, as if implying mermaids can swim as fast in water as humans can probably run on land, maybe even faster. I think Scuttle dropping the anchor is a metaphor for being based or grounded, meaning what he is about to say is completely true, and he's being 100% honest. Dingle hopper. When he twirls his hair, it looks like strands of DNA coming together, and then when his hair poofs out, it's like an explosion or life is created. <gasps> now the snarfblat dates back to prehistorical times. Then he calls the pipe a snarfblat, or an instrument that can cr make sound. A trumpet, maybe? He says it goes back to prehistoric times. How prehistoric? Ancient times? Note, the fish falls out, referring to the age of Pisces. When humans used to sit around and stare at each other all day. He said they would stare at each other all day, or communicate using telepathy. So, they invented this snarf flat to make fine music. When he blows into the pipe, or the trumpet, a plant grows. Could some type of sound enhance plant growth? Some type of frequency? I believe it's also a biblical reference to God speaking in the Bible, in Genesis, when he created the world. Maybe you can make a little planter out of it or something. The scene concludes with saying that, well, we could just use this thing as a planter, because we don't actually know what some ancient ruins or items are actually used for. Then, before the scene finally ends, Ariel departs, and you see that Scuttle is on a stranded rock geographically, so he is like the Oracle geographically, too. Ariel has to go out of her way for knowledge. The scene begins with Ariel being spied on. Predators are always lurking under the sea. As the scene begins to change, hold on a minute. I know that face. Ah, there you are, you snake. You always have to leave your calling card somewhere. What's being shown here is not an example of magic. I believe it's in a piece of advanced technology that allows you to see through the eyes of the sea creatures. Now we meet Ursula. Just like how there are interspecies battles on land, they also occur in the ocean. In this case, it seems to me to be the Kraken versus the Mer people, and their dominance and or superiority in the ocean. Ursula's monologue here shows that she was once the greatest threat to physically rule the sea, but now it's King Trident and the Mer people. In my day, we had fantastical feasts when I lived in the palace. She makes the 666 with her hands as she eats a shrimp alive. The 666 symbol is also for the owl's eye. And now look at me, wasted away to practically nothing. Banished and exiled and practically starving. She makes the M with her hand, or the mason sign. She reiterates her lower position in the ocean by explaining how she was once great and conquered the seas, but is now being forced to hide far beneath the depths. Just like the image of the Monopoly octopus with its hands in everyone's business, 
Ursula is trying to get into Ariel's personal life or personal business. I want you to keep an extra close watch on this pretty little daughter of his. She may be the key to Triton's undoing. Ursula has agents to take care of business or spy on Ariel. The daughter of a great man is the most powerful way to get to him. Evil is always lurking in the shadows, waiting to strike. In this next scene, we see the Mer people become humanized. As an example, when the colonists first came to America and started to assimilate and genocide the Native Americans, they were only able to do so because they were dehumanized, or literally looked at as animals instead of humans. I just don't know what we're going to do with you, young lady. Daddy, I'm sorry, I just forgot. As I... a result of your careless behavior. During this dialogue, we see that even merfolk have family relationships and strong bonds to kin, just like humans do. On that note, since Ariel is part of a family, she also has certain appearances to keep up and events to attend. Status even exists under the sea. No thanks to you, I am the laughing stock of the entire kingdom! When Flounder chimes in to defend Ariel, he's like a little brother. When Sebastian chastises Ariel, He's like an uncle. King Triton wants his daughter to be kept out of danger, as any good father would. How many times must we go through this? You could have been seen by one of those barbarians, by, by one of those humans. The way King Triton talks about humans is the same way people talk about sharks when going into the ocean, as a great danger that has the possibility to always occur. They are dangerous! Do you think I want to see my youngest daughter snared by some fish eater's hook? Other species seem to have more knowledge and understanding of humans than we give them credit for. As long as you live under my ocean, you'll obey my rule! King Trident says, quote, under my ocean, you'll obey my rules. Human beings are morally flexible when it suits them, but it seems other species have a code of conduct they live by. You're absolutely right, Sebastian. Of course. Ariel needs constant supervision, I... and you are just the crab to do it. Finally, King Trident assigns babysitting duty to Sebastian, further showing his love for his daughter. Sebastian follows Ariel to a secret cavern. The cavern is like a personal home or a storage space. Upon entering, he bumps into an hourglass, as though these treasures are frozen in time. For Ariel, this is like a personal shrine of human items to daydream and ponder over. It reminds me of Helga from the TV show Hey Arnold, but much less creepy. Ariel addresses the idea that because humans can create wonderful items, how could they be bad? The sad part is if she were captured, she would probably be experimented on, tortured, and dissected. As a side note, I was having a conversation with a friend about mermaids, and unfortunately he actually said this. That if we wanted to understand merfolk better, then we should attempt to capture and hold them against their will for scientific benefit. This is madness. No wonder merfolk don't want to interact with the human population if this is the mentality of the average individual. When Ariel opens the box of corkscrews, it reminds me of the caduceus for the medical field. It's also been referred to as the Staff of Hermes, which is a symbol of peace, or the God of Healing, Asclepius. But in actuality, this symbol shows native Saurian influence. To learn more about the native Saurians, the link in the description for the Lacerta files. Want more. False. When Ariel says she wants more, I believe this is false. These beings are perfectly okay with living among themselves, far away from humans. Sebastian falls and triggers a jack-in-the-box with a pentagram on the side. The creators of the movie are trolling the viewers. He pulls the curtain, the clock falls, the musical is over, time is up. Pretty clever analogy. Sebastian stands up, but is encumbered with vanity and pleasure. These things hinder his movement, much like our modern society and our symbols of status hinder our own movements. The merfolk have a collection of human items, like we have a collection of mounted fish or other items from the ocean, seashells, conches, etc. Humans are noisy and disrespectful of nature. In this scene, setting off fireworks grabs Ariel's attention, so she goes to the surface to see what's going on. The scene opens up as Ariel ascends to the surface. Marine life, or cryptids in general, are more active in the evening. Fireworks, bright lights, music, these things attract cryptids to people. The boat or ship is how humans are able to be on the ocean. It acts as a buffer between man and sea. However, here we see that some marine life is capable of climbing up onto our vessels, where they can observe humans, or even attack them. At first, I thought the men dancing were in white and black Masonic colors, but they're actually deep blue, white, and they have a red bandana on their necks. The possible countries that I thought could be represented are France, USA, or even Russia. We don't know. Dogs and other animals can smell or sense when there is a cryptid nearby. Here we see the dog greets Ariel, the aquatic humanoid, like a regular person. This is not accurate at all. The dog will be aggressively barking and possibly even hostile to the aquatic humanoid. Even Scuttle, the waterfowl, will squawk at the perceived threats, thus bringing more attention to the stealthy humanoid. Prince Eric is humble and doesn't seem concerned at all with the prestige or admiration. He's a bit disgusted at the statue. It's important for royalty and the upper class to maintain a certain image. Cryptids on land, in the air, or under the sea 
have a degree of fear of fire. Here we see Ariel's reaction, terror. After the ship crashes and the crew goes overboard, the mermaid would simply swim away and mind their own business, among their tribe of merfolk deep under the sea. Ariel, in reality, would not save Eric. She would simply ignore the whole situation and allow him to drown. The scene progresses where we see that Ariel has saved Eric and is resting on the beach. She asks, is he dead? As Scuttle opens his eye. Then, he goes to check Eric's foot and replies with, I can't make out a heartbeat. This scene is extremely important. We get a glimpse and a hint at cloning. In conspiracy theory circles, cloning is very popular among celebrities, politicians, and especially the elite. It's said that when a clone is being updated with memories or new ideologies, you can see the after effect in the form of a black eye. However, the newer model clones are said to be updated through the foot, a very significant scene that is brushed off and passed by without context to the masses. So in this next sequence, when Ariel is singing, imagine it from the perspective of her taking Eric down into the ocean with her. There she will live where he is and be a part of his world. Then the scene progresses, you get a golden light behind Ariel. She is an enlightened being. Eric is mumbling about something that couldn't have possibly happened, so it is quickly and easily dismissed by Grimsby. One of Mermaid's powers, supposedly, is being able to foresee the future, so they will know when you return to water. So, no matter what, she will be a part of your world because you will be a mermaid, or killed, or her slave. Evil exists. Ursula and Triton have probably been around for a very long time and understand the importance of not interbreeding. The outside of their room reminds me of a princess in a castle. The inside of the room reminds me of Moaning Myrtle's bathroom from the second Harry Potter movie. Ariel is attracted to Eric, a prince. There are two things going on here. One, that Eric and Ariel are both royalty, or also referred to as elite. Therefore, she won't accept anything less than the best mate. And two, that royalty interbreeds with other species for the benefit of their own kin, possibly as ways to make superior offspring or to have an extraterrestrial relationship. Sebastian sings Under the Sea, a song which promotes living underwater and how content aquatic humanoids are without interacting with humans on the surface, or any other being on the surface for that matter. I believe this is accurate. When King Trident hears about Ariel being in love, he is happy for his daughter. But he gets very angry when he hears about the possibility of mixing DNA with the human species. The older generations believe it's important to stick with your own kind and maintain a sort of tradition, while younger generations are much more liberal, open, and accepting to such concepts. Flounder adds a statue to Ariel's collection, and she absolutely loves it. She's enamored with it. King Trident enters the scene from the shadows, showing his duality of being a strong masculine father figure, capable of violence, but at the same time a soft, loving father capable of peace and joy. The patriarchal figure, who looks out for and protects the merfolk, have boundaries, rules, and traditions that are put in place for a reason. One of those rules is to not interact with humans. Contact is strictly forbidden. So when Ariel saved Eric, she basically betrayed her own race. Every merfolk knows to avoid interaction with the human race. Ariel responds that she saved him to save a life, whereas Trident places no value on human life. Ariel continues with, you don't even know him. King Trident responds that all people are the same. Spineless, fish-eating savages that have no ability to empathize. He's pretty racist. Ariel says she loves Eric, or is willing to mix her DNA with his for offspring. King Trident reiterates you cannot do that. It is forbidden to mix his DNA. However, the younger generations are often naive and don't consider the consequences of their actions. In a fit of rage, King Trident activates his trident, which I believe is a piece of ancient advanced technology, also known as Antiquitech, capable of manipulating electricity and electrical beings. It's like the tech is able to destroy the object at the level of the cell or the atom. When he destroys the globe, it's showing a very specific spot on the map. He shoots a beam between the tip of South America and Antarctica. I've heard stories of a land bridge that once existed connecting South America to Antarctica, where other races or aliens exist. Backing up this claim is Admiral Byrd and his diary entries of what he experienced down in Antarctica. I think he is showing us where other highly advanced species live and the path to get to them. A line from the movie, Black Panther, is, It's hard for a good man to be king. And this is what you see here. King Trident making the hard decisions to protect his family. At your lowest point, you're open to the greatest change. Unfortunately, that can also be in a negative direction. Just like this merfolk race has access to advanced technology, they also have access to dark magic, aka witchcraft. I like to call it sacrificial science, because in the Lacerta files, link in the description, Lacerta states that what we refer to as magic is simply advanced science we don't understand. Since Ariel's father, Trident, won't provide a positive path through the use of technology, she has to resort to engaging in sacrificial science to obtain her desires. Ariel goes to an area 
where there is a strong source of energy. In this case, it looks like a graveyard where there are lots of departed or trapped souls. Inside, she finds jellyfish tendrils, meaning if you engage in dark magic, then you can become seriously injured or even die. The man of war jellyfish is what comes to my mind. Ursula does the 666 hand symbol. Again, owl eyes. The people most willing to turn to something like dark magic are not content with their lives. Ariel is able to temporarily become a human. In the movie, it's three days, but I think it's much less. Maybe like 24 hours. Human males have this fantasy ideal of romance. Therefore, men are easily manipulated by women. The mermaid learns that in order to breed with a human, the human must first be turned into a merman. Then, technically, she can have what she wants. Once the mermaid has secured a man's heart, which simps easily give away, all she has to do is lure him to the water willingly. Once they are far enough out, she will begin to make the transformation by kissing him. However, by coming out onto land, you risk not being able to return to the water in a timely manner. If you get caught out of water as a mermaid, you're basically dead. Mermaids can live for several hundred years. Every time they make the transformation to try and capture a human mate, it costs them a decent amount of their life, which is especially harsh if they're unsuccessful. The payment for transformation in the movie is Ariel's voice. As God said or spoke in the Bible, let there be. Therefore, there is life in sound. Ursula sacrifices five living beings and a tongue. Cauldron goes red, then blue, as above in the spiritual world, so below in the physical world. Ariel signs the golden contract. Your word or signature is your bond. Humans can go back on their word with each other, but in reality, once you sign with the devil, it's real. And it's for eternity. You give up your soul when you engage in dark magic or sacrificial science. After making the transition to oxygen, it's definitely a struggle returning to the surface. There are good ones and there are bad ones. But there is no one. Our prince has one like this. Some people are so dense when it comes to common sense. Instead of being aware of your surroundings like a conscious person, Scuttle has to be bluntly told information, just like when we try to tell our family and loved ones about the harshness of our reality. They ignore or forget what we said. When we bring up conspiracy theories, they're just easily dismissed. Ariel falls back into the water, and a piece of seaweed is caught in her hair. When I saw this, I thought about Athena with the wreath in her hair. It turns out that this wreath is actually called a laurel wreath, and it's a symbol of triumph. The merfolk was triumphant in her transformation, and will succeed on her journey of obtaining a mate. Max, the dog, senses something and alerts the prince. Even when it comes to interacting with the opposite sex, a lot of people are just straight clueless. A lot of men are just straight clueless. As you can see, it was really easy to be accepted by men through just her beauty alone. Sebastian falls from the clothing line through the window, and ends up in the kitchen. He is shocked at the sight of his fellow sea creatures being boiled alive, their dead carcasses hanging over the cookware. However, this is how people would react if we found out what we were food for. Black and white checkered Masonic tiles on the floor. Even though Ariel is human for the moment, her behavior as a merfolk was quickly adjusted when she was socially questioned by those around her. The crowd is powerful. Judgment from the group is powerful. The chef or working class peasant is shown as a buffoon that can't even cook a simple meal. However, at the end, we see the one pant leg symbolism, Masonic acknowledgement, or they have different levels of Masons in even menial positions. Triton, an example of royalty, states that nobody in the entire kingdom is allowed to rest until his daughter is found. So, just blatantly disregarding the lives of his own subjects for his own desires. They depart in a white horse. Of the four horsemen of the apocalypse, the white horse, which symbolizes the Antichrist, or the bringers of peace, aka God. This is how they see themselves. The puppet hands putting on a show are interrupted by Ariel's curiosity. The hand gestures happen quickly, and I wasn't sure if these were words in the alphabet sign language. If you know, leave me a comment below. Then, the last gesture is the M hand symbolism. Again, Masons are in charge of the whole illusion. You see the seven pointed star in the room they're dancing in. There's several meanings to the pointed star, also called a heptagram. The heptagram is also used as the symbol for Babylon in Aleister Crowley's occult system Thelema. The creators are leaving Roman numerals on their work signifying a specific date, 9-11. I-X-X-I. Food, flowers, shoes, gifts to impress most women. He gives her the reins to the chariot, and it goes from a calm and peaceful ride to a fast and chaotic one. A good metaphor if men allow a woman to be in charge of the relationship. Finally, Ariel managed to get her and Eric alone in the evening out in a lagoon type setting. The point is the water is not deep enough, so even if Ariel did manage to get Eric into the water, she would not have enough time or space to submerge him and transform him. Ursula takes action to prevent Ariel from succeeding. She sacrifices a butterfly in order to shapeshift into an Ariel lookalike. 
The butterfly is a representation of the MK Ultra mind control experiments that the CIA does or that have done in the past. MK or mind control. Eric voluntarily disposes of his flute. A flute is a symbol associated with love magic. My theory is that once he voluntarily gives away his own self-love, then he is easily able to be taken advantage of and manipulated by someone who doesn't have his best interest. Ursula used sound to put Eric in a trance. Remember, MK is for mind control. Ariel put Eric into a trance, but it was only visually, whereas sound is able to access the brain even in your sleep. Ariel's voice is familiar to Eric. He is a rich simp. He is lonely and desperate. Suggestion is a powerful force. That's why all advertisements are just suggestions. Yes, the prince is getting married, just not to you. Royalty has their fair share of mistresses, but just one queen for the public eye. Notice the mermaid busts in the background. The spiral contains life within it, or in this case, Ariel's voice. It references the Fibonacci sequence. In the beginning of the movie, the front of the boat paid homage to the mermaid, and at the end of the movie, you can see it's the back of the boat. There's that Masonic hand symbol again. Shapeshifters and other beings that can use mimicry to hide their appearance are revealed in mirrors and cameras. They can't fool objects, but they can fool people. Here, Ursula throws the pin at the angel's third eye, meaning only the enlightened will understand this reference. How do birds know to fly south for the winter, or when to perch before a storm comes? It's because of magnetic fields on the earth. Animals are more in tune with it than humans. When Scuttle gets all the animals to engage in the same action, it's like mass telepathy or hive mind type of ability. In this movie, Sebastian the Crab activates it. But could it be possible to duplicate the results through the use of technology? Is this a Masonic wedding? Ariel's voice is restored and her time as a human ends. Eric is taken aback that Ariel is a mermaid, a natural reaction. However, when Ursula transforms back into her normal form, you can see the terror on the faces of the crowd, or the normal NPC people. They can't handle the truth. Once you make a deal with the devil, it cannot be broken, at least not for free. Nobody is above the universal laws that govern all. Your word is truly your bond. Ariel is shown in a crucifix position, just like Jesus. Notice the M hand sign. Ursula shows her hands, Masonic hand gesture and the 666 at the same time. Are Ariel and Ursula in the same club? Hegelian dialectic, anyone? The eels remind me of a yin-yang symbol, or as above, so below. Eric, being a simp, putting himself in harm's way for no reason, like in a trance from a siren. The way to destroy a powerful ruler is to go after their kin. Ursula misfires and kills her own kin by mistake. Ursula goes into a fit of rage. Now, I know that squids and octopuses can ink, but I think the black clouds could be a metaphor for intense power from dark magic and ancient technology. Two living beings were just sacrificed, although unintentionally. Note, right here in reality, the movie is over and Ariel has succeeded in transforming Eric. Done. Finito. Over. Have a good one. However, the movie doesn't end there. Ursula's crown casts a shadow that reminds me of a claw or of the mouth of the maw from Odyssey. The Trident will have its own video, but for right now, the least we can say is that it's some type of ancient tech that can control the weather or the oceans. Eric is like fucking Superman here to do what he does. The whirlpool looks like a portal to another world. Finally, Eric kills Ursula and swims to shore. You see her discharge from the technology. All of the people who sold their souls got their souls restored metaphorically waiting in limbo or stuck in time. You see the conversation between Sebastian and King Triton comes back to humanizing mermaids or molefolks in general. Through the use of technology, Ariel is able to return to the human world permanently. Then they get married and it's a happy Disney movie ending. But we know how that's very far from the truth. We must hasten. Solitude upon his wings